Good morning, everyone. Hi. Um, why is it when I try to connect to Teams on my phone, I'm always having to log in and then get a push? Like, it seems that it's happening all the time now. And you're connected to UHI Corp? I, well, I presume so. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, the push notification, would all, I feel like it would only come up if... Um, if there's something something with the network that you're connected to, well, it doesn't. It only happens when I'm connecting to um, a certain um, uh, Teams connections. Teams connections. I'm not like, sure off the like top the, of my head. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we could take a look. Um, yeah, it's not urgent. Maybe somebody later can. It's just that it takes me then, you know, five minutes to log in because I've got to get, I, I don't get logged in and I get to have to enter my name, my password, my, then I have to get the push. And then instead of just hitting join, join, and it's asking me to join as a guest too. It's not yeah, for everything. Uh, it's only for certain things. Certain things. Yeah, we'd have to take I, a I closer be, look. I shouldn't be joining as a guest. I yeah, no, no, not as a guest. You should have your own account and be logging into your own account. Are you on your phone right now, or are you are you on your computer? Yeah, I'm, and your... I'm on my phone. I'm I'm driving. So oh, okay. Yeah. Also, yeah, you're I'm driving. So right are you on site? You on? Nope. Okay, so that could be why it's asking you for the dual because you're off site. I see. Yeah, so it's only uh, when you're connected to UHI Corp where it shouldn't be asking you to for the deal, dual it, authentication. It, it, yeah, it doesn't do that. It doesn't do that um, every time. Okay. I'm yeah. Um, next time you're on site, um, let me know and then I can come take a closer look. Well, at I'll be on. I'll be on site in in fifteen minutes. So. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Angel. Can you hear me, Angel? She may have blocked connection there. Hey, hello. Is Carrie O'Reilly supposed to be presenting as well, or is she just an attendee? Hi, Michael. Uh, no, Carrie. Um... Uh, eventually we'll be taking over organizing the cardiology round. So I oh. added her just to see how it's uh, how it works. Did oh. you remove her? Yeah, because I thought uh, she was an attendee. I'll re um, I request her to rejoin. Okay. Did we lose Angel? Uh, I think Angel left. Uh, on purpose or by accident? I, uh, I think accidentally. I'm gonna see if I yeah. can text her. Okay.
Sorry, I had some technical difficulty. Hi. Hey. How are you? I'm good. Yourself? Right now, okay? Oh, you think? Perfect. Thanks. So, Angel, you we already ran through the dry run yesterday. So, do you have any questions before um, we get the ball um, rolling? I don't think so. I'm just gonna. I'm just trying to share my screen. Make sure everyone can see. Yep, we see it now. The color yellow, the uh, the starting screen. And if you want to uh, disable the the feature right. at the top there for um, Done. attendees yeah, to that, skip through. Yeah, the little eye. Yep. And you yep, can see perfect. me moving through slides there. Yep, I see everything. You're on. Yep, you're back to the first slide now. Awesome, thanks. And just a reminder, we'll uh, start. I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Bulens. Yeah, good morning, Angel. Hi, Dr. Bulens. What do you want me to say in introduction? <laughs> really? No, I haven't thought about that. Um, uh, okay. I don't know. If, sorry? I don't know if there's much okay. to so who have you been working on? Um, um, like, are you doing working on this with? Like, who? Who? Uh, Dr. Small. Do you have a staff? I mean, Dr. Dr. Small. Dr. Small. Yeah, he's okay. in the Callaway. Okay, he's going to try to join, but apparently, internet isn't that great up there. So. Okay. Um. Angel, um, I have a question for you in terms of your recording. So I yeah. see you turned on automatic recording. So record, rec we're recording right now. Are you okay if we record it and yep, post yeah. it later? Yeah. And I will just get an okay from Dr. Small before um, posting it, just because there's some preliminary data. But um, that's totally fine if you're recording it. Okay, perfect. So then, Hala, um, once the event is over and finished, um, it'll download the uh, uh, the recording to your OneDrive automatically. So okay. after the event, just go into your OneDrive. There should be a recording folder in there. Okay. So just find the recording for today and then just click the shared sharing option for it and just don't share it. So automatically after the event, it okay. shares it with the uh, presenters. Okay. Okay. So after the event, I'll just get Hala to turn that off and then nobody can grab it unless we kind of uh, post it. So okay. Hala, if you need help, let us know and we can uh, help you do that. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Beelands, are you uh, being the moderator today? Yes, I am. Okay, perfect. Dr. Sadnik is, is away. Okay, so um, at uh, 7.31, we'll get Hala to um, turn off the lobby notifications and we'll admit everybody. And at 7.32, uh, you can go ahead. All right, so 7.31, uh, what happens? 7.31, we're going to admit everybody from the lobby and Hala's going to turn off the lobby notifications. And then that way it'll give everybody about 30 seconds to finish coming in before you start to the, the rounds at 732. Okay, perfect, perfect. Awesome. Um, all right, so. Um, Angel, where did you do your medical school? Um, I did uh, medical school, internal medicine, everything in Ottawa. Yeah, I thought you did medical school in Ottawa. Yeah. 
Um, and um, have you settled on fellowship? Yeah, I'm doing Echo here for a year. Right, excellent. Mm -hmm. excellent. Good. How is everything going for you? How are you enjoying your year so far? It's, it's good. C3 is uh, much, much better, like in terms of, you know, like much less busy than C1 and C2. Um, doing the actually the AFNIC exam in December. So that's going to be the oh, focus for after today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. Yeah. All right. So and hopefully get so, that out of the way before Royal College. And um, uh, what are you, are you, are you still looking at? You know what's beyond uh, the Echo Fellowship? Yeah, I'm waiting to kind of hear back from Alberta because their requirements for new CT are a little different. Um, so they're just trying to see if, you know, like it's always CCS level two, because uh, I'm doing six blocks this year, nuclear and CT. So obviously CCS level two at the end of this year for nuclear. And I'm doing the asking exam to see if that would allow me to read nukes in Alberta. So that is still up in the air, but hopefully I'll figure that out by the end of this year. Right. Okay. Well, we certainly walking for another year if necessary for nukes and yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know that would be good. The only tough thing is it will be another year if my partner is going to be in Edmonton. Um, so oh, that's just another right, year. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 but, yeah. Um, yeah. We'll see. Did your partner have a position? Uh, yeah, he's starting a staff there in July 2022. As, as what? As radiology. In, in what area? Radiologist. Oh, radiologist. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Okay. And so would you be working with, um, uh, like, at the uh, Mazenkowski, or do you or well, working at um, I, uh, Royal Alex or another? I'm Thinking probably more Royal Alex. Like obviously, I haven't really. I've talked to a couple people at uh, the Royal and also at the Mass. Um, Gray Nuns and Misericordia aren't hiring, is what they told me. Anyways, I'm going to Royal Alex to do a month of CCU elective in March, actually, and I'll probably go meet a couple people at the Mass at the same time. Okay, so they have a new division head. Cardiology. Do they have Cardiology. a? Do, 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 do oh, they have a new? Oh, okay. okay. So they picked someone. At around 7.32. Oh, yeah. 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 It's confidential right now. Um, um, they don't have, have it. I guess not new yet, but there will be a new division. So when okay. are you going to, the, to, to Edmonton? I'm going in mid-March to mid-April. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, and things are settling down COVID-wise there, it sounds like. Seems, yeah, it seems like things are getting a bit better, so that's good. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so I, I'm going to be going underground any minute now, and then um, uh, I may not get disconnected. If I do, I, I will reconnect. Um, and... Uh, uh, be there for the intro for sure.
Andrew. Yeah. So, um, are you now able to be a, a, a like a co-organizer or still not? Yeah. Okay. I'm just looking at that. I just want to see. I don't have any updates available. I'm okay. trying to schedule a webinar just to see the options here. Mm -hmm. um, so I will let you know. Okay. It's supposed to be coming out this month, Hala. So I don't know if that means the beginning, the end. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, I, I check for it every day. I'll let you know because uh, I was thinking the exact same thing. Okay, no problem. So, Hala, is Carrie joining you for these? Uh, I have to add her again because I think Michael removed her and he didn't know that she's joining us. He thought that no. she was an attendee. Uh, I messaged her, but uh, I haven't got a response. I would request, should I request her to join? As a presenter, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, one sec. Okay, is one more question, Andrew. Yeah. Um, so for when people ask, want to ask questions, it's just like any Teams meeting, then they can raise their hand, right? Exactly. Yep, raise their hand and then um, that way will allow their mic so that they can unmute themselves. Uh, right. And then, yeah, that's... Uh, and or phone. they can send something in the chat. Yeah, either way, yeah, we just have to monitor the chat. Yeah, okay, sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Carrie O'Reilly is in. I'm going to make her. Carrie, are you there? Hey, yeah, you are. Perfect. Hi, Andrew. Hi, welcome. Thank you. I was on earlier, but got kicked off somehow. Yeah, that was my fault. Sorry about that, Carrie. <laughs> That's okay. Good morning, Angel. Round? Like cardio? Good morning, Carrie. Good morning. Uh, just for cardiology rounds. Oh, I thought there was a staff meeting in here. Yeah, I didn't see anything. Nobody else. Well, they just went around the corner to try to find another room. Okay, well, I mean, it's full. Yeah. 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 Hey Mark, how are you? Good, good. Uh, I made it down the path today. Um, however, I just had to hop away for cardiology rounds just to get it started.
Hey, Mike, can you take control for starting and admitting everybody? I'm just here with somebody helping them out. Sure. So, uh, 731, I'll start admitting. Yeah. And Hala turns everything off. And then 732, Dr. B lands is good to go live. All right. So, we got about 50 seconds to go. And I'll start admitting everybody. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Can you Okay, never mind. Do I need to do anything after Dr. Spielens introduced me, or it will automatically switch to me? Um, so it's all, it will automatically switch to you. I'll switch you back to you as the uh, spotlight, and then you can start the rounds. Okay, perfect. So I don't need to do anything. Thanks. Yeah, so pretty much, uh, Dr. Spielens will do the introduction, and then he'll, uh, when he gives you the signal, you can start at your convenience. All right, so I'm going to start admitting everyone now. Hala, as soon as I do that, can you just uh, change the uh, settings there? All right, so let's admit all. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure this morning to introduce one of our illustrious and amazing three C3s, Dr. Angel Fu, who, as um, many will know, trained in Ottawa Medical School Medicine and uh, now cardiology. Um, and uh, we look forward to also her joining us as an ECHO Fellow uh, in 22-23. Um, and Dr. Fu will be presenting on uh, cardio oncology, old enemies and new foes, uh, work that she's been doing um, with Dr. Small and others. Um, uh, Angel, take it away. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Thielen, for the introduction. Just want to confirm you can see my slides and hear me okay? We're good. Perfect. Um, so today I'll be talking about cardio oncology, old enemies and new foes for the next 45 to 50 minutes. So this is the outline for today's talk. So we'll start by talking about the burden of cancer and the interaction between cardiology and cancer. Cardiology, cardio oncology is a relatively new field of cardiology. However, the breadth of it is wide, and we will today only focus on a couple topics, specifically anthracycline and trastuzumab-induced cardiotoxicity, and then the new kid on the block, immunotherapy, specifically immune checkpoint inhibitor-induced cardiotoxicity. And then we'll finish the talk today by highlighting some of the ongoing cardio-oncology research here at TOH and OHI. So based on data released by the Canadian Cancer Society this November, almost one in two Canadians will develop cancer in their lifetime. The age standardized incidence rate is falling for men but remains stable for women. However, due to a growing and aging population, the number of new cases of cancer continues to rise yearly. And the same data shows that a stead, shows a steadily decreasing age standardized mortality rate from cancer from 1984 to 2021. 37% decrease in male and 22% decrease in female since 1988. However, the number of cancer deaths continue to increase again due to growing and aging population. Despite this, more patients are surviving cancer, which is awesome. However, these patients are more prone to developing cardiovascular adverse events. A study of pediatric cancer survivors by Armstrong et al. in 2009 showed that cardiovascular death is the second most common cause of death 
just after recurrence of cancer in these patients. The table in the middle is from the CCS cardio-oncology guideline in 2016. It's interesting because it compared the risk of developing cardiac disease and vascular risk factors in survivors of childhood cancer to their healthy siblings without cancer. We can see the relative risk of development of CAD and heart failure is in the order of 10 to 15. The relative risk of development of vascular risk factors, including hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia is not as high, but still has a risk ratio between 1.5 and 2. In the bottom Kaplan Maya curve here um, is from a paper done by Armenia et al. looking at um, cancer survivor with CVD, which is in the red line that we see here, which have higher mortality compared to patients with cardiovascular disease but no cancer, compared to those with cancer but no cardiovascular disease, and those with no cancer and no cardiovascular disease. And this is why it is important to identify these patients and optimize them from the cardiac perspective. This figure is from a paper by Dr. Chris Johnson et al, uh, published in CJC in 2016, and it nicely summarizes the interaction between cardiac disease and cancer. It shows that cancer and cardiovascular disease have shared risk factors such as smoking, obesity, diet, and physical inactivity. And in patients who develop cancer and therefore the need to undergo cancer therapy, they may also have either subclinical or overt cardiovascular disease that may be worsened by cancer therapy. For example, they have increased perioperative risk at time of surgery, and they can also experience various cardiotoxicities from chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and radiation therapy. Furthermore, the development of overt cardiovascular disease may lead to interruption or discontinuation of cancer therapy, which can lead to worsened cancer-related outcomes. This timeline illustrates the development of cardio-oncology as a field. The first reports of anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity was all the way back in 1966, whereas the first case of prestuzumab-induced cardiotoxicity was reported in 1998. And as we see here, there's been a significant increase in interest and in research in cardio-oncology in the last 20 years. In 1998, there were only 90 PubMed citations in cardio, if you search cardio-oncology. And in 2014, it's over 800, and last week, there's over 2,500 citations for cardio-oncology on PubMed. And various European, American, and also the Canadian Cardiology Society have also published guidelines in this area. And the Canadian guidelines, as I mentioned earlier, were published in 2016, led by Dr. Varani and Dent. And there's also increasing establishment of cardio-oncology clinic across the world, including here in Canada. This is certainly a rapidly growing field in cardiology and a very exciting time for cardio-oncology. This table here is busy, but it just summarizes the cardiovascular effects of various cancer therapy. As you see here, the, cardio, the cardiac side effects are diverse from cardiomyopathy to arrhythmia, hypertension, coronary disease, pericardial disease, valvular disease, et cetera. And a variety of cancer therapy can have cardiotoxicities, from your traditional chemotherapies like anthracycline to targeted therapy like trastuzumab, or even newer therapies like immunotherapy, such as immune checkpoint inhibitor and CAR T cell therapy that's used for uh, hematologic malignancy. And also radiation therapy, which can cause calcification of various cardiac tissues leading to pericardial disease, coronary artery disease, or valvular disease. Again, we'll only focus on anthracycline, trastuzumab, and um, immune checkpoint inhibitor-induced cardiotoxicity uh, for the next uh, 40 minutes. And this is a list of chemotherapy that's associated with LV dysfunction, all to say that it is a long list. And we see here for anthracycline, uh, it is a dose-dependent risk, whereas for trastuzumab and most other chemo or targeted therapy, it is non-dose related. So we've been talking about cardiotoxicity. What exactly is cardiotoxicity? It is an umbrella term for any adverse cardiac event, but most of the time it is used in the setting of LV dysfunction, and that's what we'll focus on today. And there are various definitions of uh, what is um, cancer-induced cardiotoxicity or LV dysfunction. Um, but as per the CCS guideline from 2016, they define cardiotoxicity as a greater than 10% decrease in LVEF from baseline 
or an LVEF drop to less than 53% during or after cancer treatment. And there are two main types of me or mechanisms of cardiotoxicity, type one and type two. So type one refers to cardiotoxicities referring, resulting from cell death, therefore thought to be non-reversible. This is dose dependent as seen in anthracycline therapy traditionally. However, there have been studies showing some may be reversible if intervened early. Type 2 cardiotoxicity is typically implicated in trastuzumab-induced cardiotoxicity, where it is mediated by cell dysfunction instead of cell death, therefore thought to be reversible, and is not dose-dependent. However, in some cases, trastuzumab can cause non-reversible cardiotoxicity. So now for the next little bit, we'll focus on the existing evidence for anthracycline and trastuzumab cardiotoxicity. But we'll start by talking about how do we identify patients at risk and how do we detect asymptomatic subclinical cardiotoxicity? So aside from cancer therapy-related risk factors, they are also patient-related risk factors for development of cardiotoxicities from cancer therapy. This table here from the ESMO guideline um, listed a few of these, such as age, either elderly, those over 75 years old, or the very young, the pediatric population, um, patients with existing cardiac disease or cardiovascular risk factors, such as existing LV dysfunction, hypertension, smoking, diabetes. These are all patients at higher risk of development of cardiotoxicity. And now we'll move on to talk about what we can use to detect subclinical cardiotoxicity and predict development of cardiac events in these patients. So first we'll talk about myocardial strain imaging. It's basically a technology that's applied to uh, transthoracic echo images. It measures the deformation of cardiac wall. A software applied to um, service echo images identifies speckles in the myocardium and it follows them throughout the cardiac cycle and look at the lengthening or shortening of it and measures a percentage. And a higher absolute value is more normal. And whether it's positive or negative, it all depends on if you'll see a lengthening or shortening. And a normal strain value depends on the vendor and software and also age and gender, however, usually range between minus 18 to minus 15. So it's important to know um, what is the normal value for your institution. And there, are, and here I believe minus 17 is the cutoff we used. Um, and there are three types of strain that's measured as we see on the left here. So the top here is longitudinal strain. Uh, middle is radial strain and the bottom is circumferential strain. As you can see, it measures the speckle movement in different directions. Clinically, and in most research, uh, we use the longitudinal strain as we see in panel A on the top here. And it is measuring in uh, apical two, three, and four chamber views on um, echo images. And strain imaging is most commonly used in the cardio-oncology population. However, it also has other um, applications such as in cardiac amyloid. And the biggest limitation of strain imaging is, uh, is limited by the quality of echo images. This is an example um, of a bullseye plot of strain, and it shows nicely that in the patients who receive cancer therapy, um, we observe a drop in strain before we see a drop in LVEF. So on the left here, so this is um, a bullseye plot uh, in the 17-segment model, um, and red is good and darker the red the better. So we see here in this patient, before receiving um, cancer therapy, the EF was normal at 61% and the strain is normal at minus 20%. The normal for this software in this paper is minus 18. And at six months, we can see the EF is still within normal range. However, the strain has dropped to an abnormal value, minus 17%. And one year from chemotherapy, not only is the strain value abnormal, they've also had an overt EF drop to less than 49%. And looking at the plot, we also see there's less red and more pink. And we know that abnormal myocardial strain is, um, has been shown to associate with adverse clinical cardiac events. Um, a retrospective study by Florescu et al. has shown that patients with breast cancer who receive epirubicin, abnormal longitudinal strain predicts the reduction of their LVEF. The survival curve on the right here looks at uh, patients with leukemia who received anthracycline and so that those with abnormal strain, 
which in the green dots here um, have worse um, survival compared to those with normal strain uh, with a blue line here. So locally, we wondered does the strain make it made a difference in our population. So we conducted a retrospective cohort study uh, in breast cancer patients who have received chemotherapy and referred to the cardio-oncology clinic at TOH for heart failure symptom or abnormal echo parameters. And we compared two groups of patients. The first cohort is two, those from 2008 to 2016. This is when strain was not done routinely. And those from 2016 to 2018, where strain was routinely performed on echo where possible. So this is their baseline demographic. So we had a total of 275 patients with no strain available in the first cohort and 68 patients in the second cohort with strain available. We can see here the strain group are slightly older, have more patients with more patients have hypertension compared to um, the, those with stra uh, without strain. However, there's fewer smokers and less family history of cardiovascular um, coronary artery disease. However, the rate of previously established cardiac disease is low in this population. And based on our preliminary analysis so far, um, we didn't see a difference in all-cause death or heart failure emission. Um, however, there's numerically a higher rate of all-cause death, but fewer heart failure emission in the strain group, but not statistically significant. There's no difference in the ch rate of change in cardiovascular medications. And the wait time from referral to consult is also similar between two groups at approximately one month. This is preliminary data, and there are a lot of more nuances that we need to look into, such as uh, interruption of therapy, et cetera. However, based on this preliminary data, so far it shows that the routine use of strain in patients with breast cancer does, uh, does not change the all-cause death, heart failure emission, or rate of cardiovascular medication changes in wait time. However, these patients are seen in a very timely manner, which may negate the effects of a strain imaging. And we suspect timely intervention may negate the benefits of um, strain in a study population because it's been shown that in patients with early detection of anthracycline cardiotoxicity, it can be reversible. In this study by Cardinal et al. In, done in 2010, they included 201 consecutive patients with anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity with the plan to start enalapril and, if possible, carvedilol. The median time from their echo to initiation of heart failure treatment was four months. And we see here, um, and out of these patients, 85 of them had normalized EF, so responders, 26 had partial response, and 90 had no response. On the graph here on the left, we see that all the responders um, have therapy started within six months of that normal echo, and whereas the earlier to start, uh, the higher the rates of responder. And there are no one um, who had the therapy started after six months um, had response to therapy. And um, on this Kaplan-Meier curve on the right, and we see that responder has significantly less cardiac events compared to those with uh, partial and non-responders. And next we'll talk about the role of cardio cardiac biomarkers in the detection of asymptomatic subclinical cardiotoxicity. Bonnie Kai et al. conducted a study with 78 patients with breast cancer undergoing doxorubicin and trastuzumab therapy. And they measured eight different uh, biomarkers at baseline after anthracycline therapy, so three months and three months after that. And this top table here, these are the different biomarkers they looked at. Um, and essentially what they've shown is that an abnormal baseline troponin, um, or abnormal uh, sorry, an abnormal troponin after three months, and the interval chain um, of troponin um, is pre uh, increases the risk of development of cardiotoxicity. No other clinically used biomarkers are shown to associate with cardiotoxicity in this study. The bottom graph shows a model-based probability graph to, of development of cardiotoxicity according to percentile change in troponin. So the blue is 90th percentile, so more troponin change compared to, let's say, the orange, which is only 10%, uh, 10 percentile. And we see that those with a higher change or increase in troponin has a higher probability of development of cardiotoxicity. 
And this Cardinal et al. have also looked at another group of 211 high-risk breast cancer patients undergoing high-dose chemotherapy. They all had normal troponin pre-chemotherapy. However, at time zero, immediately post-chemotherapy, we see that almost 30% of the troponin assays were positive. On the bottom here, we see that after cycle three of chemotherapy, more than 30% of patients have positive troponin assay. On the right here, it shows the LVEF change in the troponin negative group in circles compared to those with troponin, uh, positive troponin in uh, squares here. And we can see the troponin positive group have a higher LVEF drop compared to those with negative troponin throughout chemotherapy. And these data shows that troponin rise is common post chemotherapy, and it may predict um, over clinical EF drop in these patients. So um, this uh, table here summarizes a few of the studies that look at how we can de um, detect car early cardiotoxicity. And one of the most uh, quoted one is by Sawaya et al. And they've shown that a 10% decrease in strain, like relative decrease, and elevation of troponin has a 97% specificity for predicting cardiotoxicity. The negative predictive value of um, this with no strain decrease and no, and no elevated troponin is high at 97%. So the 2016 CCS guidelines suggest that strain imaging can be considered for early detection of subclinical LV dysfunction, and a weak recommendation was made for serial use of cardiac biomarkers such as troponin and BMP for um, patients planned for treatment with potentially cardiotoxic cancer therapy. Next, we'll switch gear a bit to talk about whether coronary artery calcium is useful in this population. So as we know, cancer patients often get lots of cross-sectional imaging, including chest CT. Um, and so a group here have wondered whether a presence of coronary artery calcium seen on these imaging that's already done can predict coronary events, heart failure, or cancer outcomes in these patients. As shown here are two axial images of non-contrast CT. They're non-cardiac CT, so they're not gated. Um, however, we can see clearly the presence of aortic valve calcium, LED, RCA, and circumflex calcium. Although we cannot get an accurate calcium score from these images, we can see the presence or absence of calcium and also estimate the Agastin score roughly. And this is a study done here in Ottawa by Will Phillips, who is one of the internal medicine residents here with Dr. Small and group here, uh, retrospectively looking at the chest CT of 260 breast cancer patients who were referred to the cardio-oncology clinic. As we can see here, the reporting of coronary presence of coronary calcium is uh, infrequent uh, until 2013 to 2016, where we see an increase in uptake in terms of reporting of coronary calcium because of a new reporting guideline that was published. On the right here, it shows that the more the ca uh, calcium there is, the higher the rate of reporting. The same group then also looked at the outcomes between the groups that had coronary calcium or not. They showed that there's no difference in mortality, but not surprisingly, those with coronary calcium has a higher rate of revascularization, but also heart failure events. And they performed a survival analysis for cardiac events uh, using a Cox proportional regression and adjusted it for Framingham, uh, uh, Framingham risk and cancer stage, and those who have, with presence of coronary artery calcium still have more car, uh, events compared to those without. And we can see here, not only is coronary artery calcium um, associated with higher uh, events, uh, cancer stage also is associated with higher events. And this is another study here that was done by Huda Elmas et al. and Dr. Small in the group, and looking at 280 cancer patients who underwent FDG full body PET with CT attenuation. And they analyzed the CT for coronary artery calcium and follow up for nine years. And here what we see on the uh, top right here, this is an FD, full body FDG, FDG image of a patient with a localized cancer compared to the bottom picture, which this patient unfortunately has a uh, diffuse metastasis. And we can see here, these are their CTs and we can see presence of coronary artery calcium. So what this 
looked at is they separate the patients into early cancer uh, without metastases and those with advanced cancer with metastases. And we see here those with no metastases, those with early cancer, patients with coronary artery calcium in this group have a worse survival compared to those without coronary artery calcium. However, when we look at the, those with advanced cancer, presence of coronary artery, artery calcium doesn't matter as they have um, a high mortality regardless and it's not difference, not difference between the two groups. And this holds true even when they adjusted for Framingham risk score. So coronary artery calcium tends to be underreported, at least in our institution. However, over the years, it seems to be an increase in reporting. And based on studies done locally, those with coronary artery calcium have worse outcomes than those with early stage cancer. That doesn't seem to affect mortality in those with advanced cancer. This may represent prime opportunities for cardiac optimization, such as initiation of statin in these patients that are currently being missed. So next, we'll talk about so what we can what can we do for these patients, um, these high risk patients who are undergoing potentially cardiotoxic cancer therapy, um, and we'll review the existing evidence for statin, beta blocker, ACE and ARP, and also briefly on dextrazosine. So Stacey and et al. performed a retrospective study with 201 patients with breast cancer undergoing anthracycline therapy. They were stratified into statin versus no statin use during cancer therapy. And we see here patients uh, on statin uh, in the red line here are less likely to develop heart failure compared to those not on statin in blue line here. However, the problem with this study is that the patients who are on statin Many more of them are on also ACE inhibitor and beta blocker, which have confounding factors for the outcome. And the same group then looked at 318 patients uh, who had trastuzumab and anthracycline therapy for breast cancer and stratified based on whether they had continuous beta blocker use during chemotherapy. We see here those who have beta blocker use um, in red here this time had lower incidence of development of heart failure compared to those without beta blocker use. And they also show that there's no difference in non-cardiac mortality. This is a busy slide here, but this table basically summarizes a few RCTs looking at ACE, ARP, um, and beta blocker in this population. So in ASINs, um, they included lymphoma patient exposed to doxorubicin and randomized to enalapril versus metoprolol versus placebo. They show that there's no echo of clinical benefits um, in cardioprotective therapy. However, only a low rate of patient 5% developed clinical heart failure. In overcome, they randomized leukemia or lymphoma patient with stem cell transplant uh, to enalapril and carvedilol versus placebo. And they showed that those on cardioprotective therapy had an improvement of LVEF by ECHO. And we'll look at Medicor and Prada in a bit more detail in the next few slides. So the Medicor 101 breast study is a double-blinded uh, randomized controlled trial with 94 patients with HER2 positive early breast cancers. These patients were randomized to perindopril, bisoprolol, or placebo. After 17 cycles of trastuzumab, they've shown that the bisoprolol group has less EF decline compared to perindopril and placebo. They've also shown that perindopril and bisoprolol were both independent predictors of maintaining LVEF on multivariate analysis. However, they didn't look at a clinical outcome in this study. The prevention of cardiac dysfunction during a juvenile breast cancer therapy PRADA trial is a two by two factorial randomized controlled trial randomizing 130 women who are scheduled to receive a juvenile chem chemotherapy with a FEC regimen, 5 fluorouracil, epirubicin, and cyclophosphamide with no prior history of CAD. They were randomized to candesartan placebo, met metoprolol placebo, candesartan plus metoprolol, and placebo placebo. Therapies were started after baseline examination, but before initiation of chemotherapy. And the primary outcome of this study is the change in LVEF from baseline to completion of therapy as measured by CMR. And the study shows that there's no, first, there's no interaction between candesartan and metoprolol, which allowed them to perform further analysis. They showed that patients who had candesartan and placebo 
has significantly less LVEF reduction compared to those on placebo and placebo. Interestingly, those on candesartan and metoprolol had no difference compared to the placebo group, and metoprolol alone had no difference compared to placebo group. Of note, none of these patients had developed clinical heart failure. And the PRADA-2 trial uh, was published in earlier this year, and th this is an extended follow-up of the PRADA study at two years. Interestingly, here it shows that it doesn't matter whether you receive candesartan or metoprolol or placebo, there is no difference in terms of LVEF um, at two years. Um, Googlin et al. also did a double-blinded RCT uh, that was published in 2016, sorry, 2019 in JAX that included 468 women with breast cancer who received trastuzumab. Some have also received anthracycline, but not all. These patients were randomized to lisinopril versus carvedilol versus placebo to prevent trastuzumab cardiotoxicity in these patients. And when they analyzed all comers, whether they um, received anthracycline or not, there's comparable cardiotoxicity at two years, about 30% in each group. However, if only looking at patients who have received anthracycline and also trastuzumab, there's significantly more patients in the placebo group with cardiotoxicity at 47% compared to those on lisinopril, 37% uh, or carvedilol, 32%. So these studies are looking at all comers undergoing potentially cardiotoxic chemotherapy and not those with evidence of subclinical cardiotoxicity. And there seems to be some you know, mixed results in terms of whether they really make a difference. However, the guideline does recommend that these cardioprotective therapy can be considered in these patients. But when do we start these therapy? So the circle one uh, study one year outcome is a RCT of patients exposed to anthracycline based chemotherapy with another risk factor of development of heart failure, including exposure to trastuzumab, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, uh, doc, uh, cumulative doxorubicin dose greater than 450 milligram per meter square, or any two um, of the following heart failure risk factors, such as age over 65, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, or previous MI. They've excluded patients with existing reduced ES. Patients were randomized to either strain-guided uh, surveillance versus EF-guided surveillance. So these patients in the strain-guided surveillance group, if they have a relative reduction of strain by 12%, they're started on ACE and a beta blocker. Versus those in the EF-guided surveillance group, they're only started on ACE and beta blocker if they have a symptomatic drop of EF of 5%, or asymptomatic drop of EF of 10% compared to the baseline to less than 55%. So at one year follow-up, they showed that the LVEF in the EF guided group is less than the strain guided group. Um, the p-value is right at 0.05. However, the LVEF you can see here is still within the normal range um, for most vast majority of patients. And there's no significant difference in strain between the two groups but both groups had a significant drop in the strain. And in terms of chemotherapy-induced cardiac dysfunction in this study, the strain-guided group has significantly fewer um, patients developing um, cardiac dysfunction compared to the EF-guided group at 5.8% versus 13.7%, which is um, statistically significant. And this suggests that a strain-guided approach may be beneficial uh, in these patients. And the ICOC-1 study looked at troponin. It is a multicenter RCT comparing a preventive versus troponin-triggered approach to prevent anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity. They included 273 patients getting chemotherapy with anthracycline and randomized to the preventive group who started enalapril at time of first chemotherapy versus the troponin trigger group who only gets put on enalapril if they have a positive troponin assay. And this graph here is to show that the overall probability of development of uh, positive troponin is similar between the two groups. The secondary endpoints included all-cause mortality, LV dysfunction, cardiovascular hospitalization, um, heart failure, stroke, ACS, arrhythmia. There's no difference between either group. So here in TOH, the approach is that if the troponin is elevated, then we try to put them on beta blocker and, if possible, ACE inhibitor. 
The difficulty is that troponin is not routinely measured in patients post-chemotherapy in the medical day unit. The other limitation is that patients on chemotherapy or targeted therapy, they can often um, experience side effects such as nausea, vomiting, mucositis, which can all lead to hypovolemia and hypotension. So that often limits the initiation of these agents. So just a very quick slide on dexrazosine that some of you may have heard of. So this is a drug that's prescribed by an oncologist, not us. Um, it is a iron chelator, EDTA derivative, and it has been shown to reduce the production of free radicals at the time of anthracycline therapy, which makes sense because production of free, free radical is one of the ways that anthracycline causes cardiotoxicity. It has been approved for use in metastatic breast cancer patients when their equivalent doxorubicin dose is greater than 300 milligram per meter square. And it's been shown in this um, systematic review here that um, dexrazosine, uh, patients on dexrazosine seem to have a lower rate of development uh, of clinical heart failure compared to those um, with, uh, uh, on placebo or not on dexrazosine. However, there's been some concerns regarding dextrazosine as it may diminish the effect of anthracycline and also increases the occurrence of secondary cancer, which was initially shown in a study of childhood cancer survivor of lymphoma at four years. However, further studies up to 12 years have shown that there's actually no difference in the rate of secondary cancer. So sometimes you may see breast cancer patients who are also on dextrazosine. So in this meta-analysis from 2013 by Callum et al., it showed that dextrazosine, beta blocker, statin, and angiotensin antagonists were all, um, they come out better compared to uh, patients not on these in terms of development of um, cardiovascular events. However, these are all small number retrospective study, and the RCTs that we've talked about are not included in this meta-analysis because it was done in 2013. So the CCF recommend that for those with high risk for development of cancer treatment related LV dysfunction, ACE inhibitor or angiotensin um, receptor blocker and or beta blocker and or statin can be considered to reduce the risk of cardiotoxicity. They also recommend that for those with an asymptomatic EF drop should have ACE or ARP and beta blocker started even if the LV EF remains about 40%. In terms of surveillance of asymptomatic patients, the ESMO guidelines recommends periodic measurements of biomarkers such as troponin and BMP, and also periodic assessment of LVEF after cumulative equivalent dose of 250 milligram per meter square of doxorubicin. And, um, in, the, and uh, in terms of trastuzumab, uh, they recommend echo every three months in early treatment to monitor for development of LV dysfunction. So this is a proposed algorithm for management of early asymptomatic cancer-induced cardiotoxicity published by Alexandra et al. and Jack last year. So if patients have elevated troponin or an absolute strain drop of 5% or a relative drop of 12%, obviously you want to check and treat for any other associated condition, but and all these patients should be assessed by cardio-oncology specialists if available. Uh, if they have one or the other, they recommend discussion of starting ACE and or beta blocker, and then follow up at three weeks and then every three months, or sooner if they develop symptoms. However, if they both have both elevated troponin and an abnormal drop of strain, then they recommend starting ACE and or beta blocker with close follow-up. These patients should continue the same cancer treatment therapy um, from cardiac perspective anyways, as long as their EF maintain uh, normal, and they are asymptomatic. And if the patient develops overt cancer treatment-related LV systolic dysfunction, which they defined as an LVEF drop of 10% to a value less than 50%, or a drop of 20%, then you stratify into whether they're symptomatic or not. If they're symptomatic, they recommend starting ACE and beta blocker and holding cancer treatment with close monitoring. If they continue to have heart failure symptoms, then you want to discuss, or the oncologist want to discuss permanent stop of the involved cancer treatment. Whereas if they are asymptomatic, then you can discuss resuming of the involved cancer treatment, which if the LVEF improves on, um, on ACE and beta blocker, which we sometimes see in patients with trastuzumab-induced cardiotoxicity. 
If patients are asymptomatic, you still want to start on an ACE and beta blocker. And if their EF is greater than 40% and they're not on anthracycline, then you can continue the same therapy again if they're asymptomatic and EF is greater than 40%, but you need to do periodic or every three months echo BMP and physical exam on these patients. However, if they're on anthracycline or the EF is less than 40%, you should hold the cancer therapy. And of course, these are all just a proposed algorithm and it requires decision to, you know, continue or stop cancer therapy is up to the medical oncologist. But uh, from a cardiologist perspective, this is an algorithm that's been proposed. So for the next 10 minutes, we'll switch gear to talk about our new foes, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. So it is known that cancer cells evade our immune system and eventual destruction by triggering the overextraction or activation of inhibitor checkpoint pathways that suppresses the host's ability to recognize um, and mount an immune response against the tumor cell. Immune checkpoint inhibitors are monoclonal antibodies that activate T cells and initiate an adaptive immune response to allow the immune system to recognize abnormal cancerous cells. And currently, there's three types of immune checkpoint inhibitor in use. So these are CTLA-4 inhibitors, such as ipilimumab, PD-1 inhibitor, such as pembrolizumab, nivolumab, semiblimab, and PD-L1 inhibitor, atezolizumab, avalumab, and dervalumab. So the use of chem immunotherapy or immune checkpoint inhibitor is increasing and the indication is widening. Currently, most commonly is being used in patients with metastatic melanoma and non-small cell lung cancer, and certain head and neck cancer, lymphoma, and uh, renal cell carcinoma. And we can see here, all of them have some sort of cardiotoxic effects included in their FDA, FDA label, most commonly myocarditis and pericarditis. However, immune checkpoint inhibitor cardiotoxicity goes beyond myocarditis and pericarditis. They can also cause cardiomyopathy, including takotsubo cardiomyopathy, myocardial infarction, atrial or ventricular arrhythmia, or conduction abnormality. And we'll focus on uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor-associated myocarditis for the next part, as we have seen a handful of cases here at OHI. So the incidence of immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis is anywhere from 0.09 to 1.1%, depending on which paper you use, uh, you read and which uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor we're looking at. The mechanism is unclear. However, autopsies have shown increased inflammatory CD4 and CD8 T cells, which is consistent with the action of immune checkpoint inhibitor. And these often occur early in the treatment course. So the median time to presentation is 34 to 65 days from the first treatment, and 81% occurs within the first three months of immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, which equates to about three cycles. However, it's important to keep in mind that these can also occur months after exposure, even though it's weird. There are some risk factors that's been identified for increasing the risk of developing myocarditis in these patients, including combination immune therapy, such as um, combination of volumab and apilidumab that's used in uh, metastatic melanoma, uh, patients who are female, and those who are older, greater than 75 years old. And the mortality of immune um, and uh, myocarditis is one of the rarest form of side effects from immune uh, checkpoint inhibitor. However, it has the highest mortality, which been quoted to up to 50%. Therefore, it's extremely important for us to recognize these patients and treat them promptly. And so how do we diagnose these patients? So firstly, these patients are either currently or recently have been on immune checkpoint inhibitor. And the symptoms will be similar to non-immune checkpoint related myocarditis, such as chest pain, heart failure symptoms, arrhythmia, and a thorough history and physical exam should be done as usual. And these patients could have ECG, troponin, BNP or antipro BNP, and transthoracic echo stem. And you should of course, always consider other etiologies such as ACS. In this um, diagram from a paper from Zhang et al. that was published in JAK this year, they propose that in, um, in patients who are unstable and you're suspecting immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis, to go ahead with cardiac catheterization, hemodynamic assessment, and also endomyocardial um, biopsy to confirm or exclude the diagnosis. And um, in patients who are stable, 
then you sh they should have a cardiac MRI done with T1, T2 mapping uh, for diagnosis of myocarditis. However, they also suggest even if the CMR is normal, um, but they have persistent, you have a high clinical suspicion, uh, you can proceed with endomyocardial biopsy. But if your CMR shows myocarditis, then you can, um, you don't need to do a biopsy. And from what I know from the cases here, I don't believe any of them has undergone endomyocardial, endomyocardial biopsy. And the strain has a role in, you know, patients with um, immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. So Awadala et al. attempted to answer this question. They looked at 101 patients on immune checkpoint inhibitor with myocarditis compared to those without myocarditis. And they showed that those with myocarditis, not surprisingly, have reduced EF and more abnormal strain and more decrease in the strain. The Kaplan-Meier survival curve on the right shows that those with normal global longitudinal strain so defined as greater than 16% in this study, um, have virtually no maze events uh, in the four months of follow-up um, from diagnosis of myocarditis. However, those with mild abnormal strain or very abnormal strain have significantly more maze events um, within four months of diagnosis of myocarditis. So this shows that abnormal strain predicts a worse outcome in patients with immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. And in terms of treatment of these patients, there's currently a lack of randomized controlled trial. trial um, and, but overall, the recommendation is to stop the immune checkpoint inhibitor. And uh, these patients should be admitted to a telemetry bed to monitor for development of arrhythmia. Early immunosuppression is the cornerstone therapy for these patients. Corticosteroids is first line, and it's been recommended a regimen of pulse methylprednisolone one gram per day for three to four days, followed by oral prednisone one milligram per kilogram per day. If patients are completely stable, um, starting with oral prednisone is also very reasonable, and I think what's been done here for some of our patients. If that's not if this doesn't work, then you can consider other immunosuppressant agents, which uh, such as mycophenolate, which been, which has been used here. However, if that still doesn't work, then other therapies such as infliximab, CTLA-4 agonist, ATG, IVIG can be considered. However, there's minimal evidence uh, for use of these agents in these patients. So for the next few minutes, we'll just quickly talk about a couple studies that's um, ongoing or we're hoping to start um, here at OHI. So this... Um, Study, uh, one of the ongoing studies looking at uh, matching 200 breast cancer patients referred to the cardio oncology clinic compared to um, match to 400 patients at the CCO, uh, the Cancer Care Ontario database, match for age, gender, and cancer stage. So, total is 600 patients, and they were stratified into early and late stage cancer. We can see here on the right, in patients with late stage cancer, it doesn't matter whether they refer to cardio oncology clinic or not. They have high mortality and it's mainly driven by cancer death, almost all of them. However, in those in early cancer stage, we can see here those referred to the cardio oncology clinic actually has a higher mortality. Um, but we see the mortality, the higher mortality is driven by more cancer death and infection. And there's no difference in cardiovascular death. This begs the question whether, apart from the what we've matched between um, these patients, uh, whether there's differences in terms of, you know, their vascular risk factors um, that will lead to a higher mortality. And th the other thing is maybe patients referred to the cardio-oncology clinic experience more interruption of their cancer therapy, which leads to an increase of cancer death. And these nuances will be further investigated and analyzed in this study. And another study that we're um, hoping to start is looking at coronary artery calcium on lung cancer screening CT. So since 2017, TOH has performed over 7,000 low-dose chest CTs for lung cancer screening. And uh, these are patients who are 55 to 74 year olds with more than 20 pack years smoking history. And these are high-risk populations for coronary events. The prevalence studies have shown the prevalence for coronary artery calcium is 80 to 95% in men and 60 to 85% in women in this population. So the plan is to conduct a study with a derivation cohort using AI compared to clinical coronary artery calcium scoring and to identify whether a certain score is associated with more outcomes and then proceed with a validation cohort with hopes to develop um, 
and use of AI and clinical pathway to improve the outcome and survival in these high-risk patients. And so here are just a few take-home points um, for my talk today. Uh, so more and more patients are surviving from cancer and living with cardiovascular sequelae of the cancer therapy. Cancer-induced cardiotoxic cancer therapy-induced cardiotoxicities are present in many different forms. And what we've talked about today are only the tip of the iceberg. Anthracycline and trastuzumab use is associated with LV, reduced LV dysfunction and development of heart failure. And it's important to recognize these patients and start cardioprotective therapy. And immune checkpoint inhibitors are being used increasingly. So we'll see more and more patients with this. I think currently there's about 500 patients in Ottawa um, that's on these therapies. And these are associated with myocarditis, which has potentially a very high mortality. Therefore, it's extremely important to recognize and discontinue immune checkpoint inhibitor along with their oncologist and to start early immunosuppression therapy with steroids. And I hope I've highlighted the importance of close collaboration between cardiologists and oncologists in this new field of cardiology to uh, optimize this unique patient population. Um, so that's all I have. And I just want to say a special thank you to Dr. Gary Small for all his help and guidance on this presentation and to the cardio-oncology team at TOH for all the teaching throughout the year. So Dr. Garuba, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Law, Dr. Small, and Dr. Turek. And I will take any question now. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Dr. Fu. That was an awesome presentation. And thank you for, um, I was remiss in, at the um, start, not acknowledging the great work of the cardio-oncology clinic uh, with uh, <clears throat> Dr. Johnson, Dr. Garuba, Dr. Loss, uh, Dr. Small, and Dr. Turek. They've done an amazing job. Um, I'm actually reminded of, um, way back when, when Dr. Chow started as a staff, his first grant was actually on this topic, and he actually proposed um, use of troponin as a, a method to uh, for early detection. Um, and unfortunately at the time, um, uh, could not get buy-in from the oncologists to do the study, so it kind of fell off uh, fell to the wayside, which is unfortunate because obviously it's turned out to be a potentially valuable tool. So, um, you know, this has been on the minds of people a long time, but, you know, we're very fortunate to have um, the leadership of our colleagues who've uh, uh, taken this to heart uh, um, um, literally and figuratively uh, uh, for the cancer patients and have done a great, great job with it. Um, there are a lot of questions uh, uh, showing the uh, great interest in this topic. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll start with um, a comment uh, on uh, from Dr. Liu. Uh, I'll try not to miss any of the other comments as well, but uh, pointing out that BNP may also be useful, and maybe you could comment on that briefly. Uh, he also comments on radiation, which is a question I had as well. Um, that that basically the toxicity is enhanced or increased when there is radiation, and and then a question on the echo strain measurement, uh, whether it's um, uh, standardized well across uh, platforms uh, and different sites. And Dr. Burwash makes a comment about that, but um, uh, but maybe uh, you could you could comment on 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 the use of strain and BNP. Mm. Yeah, so I think uh, BMP certainly has a role. I think Troponin has more research has done um, to look at uh, prediction of early uh, subclinical uh, cardiotoxicity in this population. Um, but there's some signal that BMP may also be helpful and the guideline, the recommendations from the guidelines uh, does uh, reflect that. Um, and uh, in terms of radiation exposure, absolutely. A lot of these patients also receive, especially breast cancer patients, uh, receive uh, radiation that, um, where the heart, the heart is in the field. Over the years, the, um, the radiation oncologists and have gotten better and better at you know, minimizing the area of um, radiation therapy and trying to avoid you know, the, cardi uh, the heart if possible. Um, but certainly radiation uh, increases the risk of cardiotoxicity. And I've seen a couple of cases of patients with valvular disease from, you know, radiation from the previous radiation. And we've seen a number of cases with constriction. And that's another hour talk or longer on its own, right, sure. radiation induced sure. cardiotoxicity. But that's, yeah. that's an excellent point. Yeah. Um, and I guess the last question is about strain. 
So um, I'm not sure if, if like, so it's really dependent on the platform or the software or vendor that's being used, as all of them have also even have a different um, guy, um, different cutoff for what's normal. Um, but from my limited experience with looking at strain uh, when I was uh, more so at a general, because they do a lot more of this with the oncology patients. Um, the computer software is quite good at, you know, like identifying the region and in order to like, you know, to minimize uh, inter-observer variability, um, then uh, most of the time we, it, unless there's an egregious error in terms of their mapping, we kind of leave it to try to improve the reproduce, reproducibility. I'm actually not sure if the OHI and the TOH uses the same vendor. I don't know if Dr. Small or any, or any of the echocardiographer or cardio-oncologist can comment on that. So um, I see a hand up here, and I was going to remind people that you can um, uh, uh, unmute and speak. I see Gary's hand up. So Gary, um, uh, take it away. Well done, Angel. It's a great talk. Um, and uh, hello, everyone from Iqaluit. I'm hoping that the internet's okay and you can hear me. Yes, very well. And, uh, so um, just a few points really on, on those questions. So I think, so NT Pro BMP, we do use more to measure kind of symptomatic heart failure. It has less of a role in, in detecting asymptomatic cardiac toxicity, as Angel explained, you know, troponin really would be our biomarker of choice for that. The radiation uh, story, you, you're exactly right. Um, and that we also see a dose response for doxycycline. So if they've had doxycycline more than 250 milligrams per meter squared, then, then and mantle radiation therapy, we see the risk of sort of cardiotoxicity increase like four to six fold. So whereas if it's less than 250 milligrams per meter squared, with those shrooms and it's a lot less, uh, the, the actual synergistic effect of the radiation. And lastly, to Dr. Burwash's point, so obviously we, we've moved to using this automated strain using TomTech software. And, um, so we've, we've been looking at what, what is normal, what's described on a normal um, registries for that. And that's why we kind of use this um, rather em empiric number, this this 17% this minus 17% uh, to, to try and make it easier. We look really to see if, if that goes down by two percentage points or goes up, if you like, to minus 15 before we would pull the trigger on any treatment um, in terms of starting prophylactic therapies. Um, but he's exactly right. And, you know, is, is that validated in many centres? No. Um, and is that what's in, throughout Canada? I don't know. So, um, but it, it's it's kind of an empiric thing we, we've decided to do locally based on what's been described in terms of normal registries. And um, obviously that's also backed up with what we would then also trend troponins in these people. Thanks so again, Angel, great talk. A question to Dr. Fu and Dr. Small or Dr. Johnson um, um, uh, or Dr. Burwash. Uh, if we are, if we have a patient maybe they are or are not being are or are not being followed in the um, cardio oncology clinic and we want to order an echo for these people are we specifically asking for strain is strain being done routinely on these pa on patients or do we specifically have to request it do you know i i i can say that angel you're like so, so, so basically, there's a, a tick box for card, for oncology protocol, one on the echo requisition. So, if you tick that, certainly at the general, then they will, then they would take strain images. Nowadays, we can also interpret some of the 2D images using the um, speckle tracking on the TomTech software. So, it is actually possible as long as the images are, are reasonable quality to actually go back and look at that. And again, I think Ian may have a question, a comment about the the quality of the two different techniques using different frame rates for them. But we, by and large, if the image quality is good enough, the speckle tracking based on the 2D images is 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 adequate uh, to, to make a comment so on, on the strain. So, you know, we can do this retrospectively as well. If, if, <coughs> if you know, an echo comes back and it's not got a strain comment, it can be done, so. Yes, and, and Dr. Burwash comments, don't just say uh, assess uh, LV and valves. Um, uh, give us some information, uh, and and if you if you mention it's a cancer patient, then they'll be doing the strain. So, um, uh, so that's helpful. Um, uh, uh, still, a couple more questions. 
Um, lots of interest in this, uh, uh, Dr. Fu, so this is great. Um, I, I actually noted that there was, you know, the, the guidelines, if you read them or the, that algorithm, the one you showed at the end, is basically asking for 20 percentage, either a drop of 10 percent, um, if the EF is more than 50, I think it was, and then a drop of 20 percentage points, uh, which is quite dramatic. Uh, did I? Uh, yeah, so I think 10% if it's less than 50. OK, that's fair enough. And 20 percentage points uh, if it's presumably more than 50. So that's like going from 51 to 31. That's yeah, so I think extreme. That's yeah, so this just from this, uh, this is not the, a guideline from Alessandra at all. Um, this is, uh, they just propose this algorithm, and this is for patients with over cancer treatment related compared to those with, um, uh, with guideline, and most of the talk is on these early cancer uh, treat, uh, subclinical cardiotoxicity. But I think this is just what they recommend. But I, if their drop is between like 10% from 51 to 41, they would fall between this. You don't need to, if, but if they're 70% to begin with and drop to 50, then they will also qualify. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, an another question from uh, Dr. Nisnik. Um, and so Dr. Fu or perhaps Dr. Johnson could answer this. If there is structured follow up for cardiovascular disease prevention and chronic cardiovascular disease management, post-treatment and discharge from the cardio-oncology clinic. Do you, are you yeah, aware I'm, of that? I'm, um, and Dr. Johnson, Dr. Small, and um, everyone can type in. I am not aware of uh, any structure follow-up after discharge of cardio-oncology clinic. Certainly the cardio-oncology clinic, if they identify patients at risk, they will optimize them um, and monitor uh, and for any development of cardiac toxicity. But I'm not aware of any structure follow structured follow-up after they've been discharged from cardio-oncology. I see Dr. Small has his hands up. Yeah, Dr. Johnson says limited. Um, uh, and Dr. Garuba says that if... Um, if patients still have residual CV disease, even when treatment is done, they're transferred to the general cardiology clinic. Um, and there's a small program for prostate cancer. Um, uh, Gary, Dr. Small. Yeah, I think um, my colleagues, you know, they, what they say is correct, but we also do and um, have a survivorship uh, clinic that's run by uh, Dr. Ghosh, um, mainly out of uh, Merivale, uh, but, uh, there, there is that, and some of us will, will take on these patients, obviously, because we get to know them. Um, so, if they've got ongoing cardiovascular, they often are just adopted into, you know, into our own clinic. Certainly, that's what my practice. Um, if they're relatively well, and I want somebody to be followed, sort of long term for doxorubicin or, or an anthracycline toxicity, then that's the type of person I would ask Dr. Ghosh if she kindly look after. So. I think you know we we don't they're not abandoned and part of the part of the process of the coronary calcium initiative is to make sure that we've actually looked under every stone so that long term these patients will have optimized cardiovascular outcomes in terms of hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, etc. So yes, yeah, that that thanks um, and and uh, there's also responses from Dr. Law, Dr. Garuba, Dr. Johnson. Uh, on other um, follow-ups, a small program of the breast cancer survivorship program for young patients who had childhood cancers. Um, and uh, of course, a lot of this can be done uh, by primary care with uh, with our guidance. Uh, and Joel, uh, Dr. Nisnik points out that the OCC is also glad to take these patients. Um, all right, so uh, um, uh, on that note, um, we're past the hour, but this has been Great, um, really an excellent presentation, a great overview, and uh, really a lot of uh, dialogue in the chat box. So it's uh, showing the interest. Uh, so congratulations for a great presentation, uh, and thank you everyone for your engagement. Uh, have a great day. Way to go, Dr. Wu. Thanks, Thanks. Dr. Beamer, and thanks everyone. Great job.